movie, The Last Crusade, Indiana Jones finds himself on this large chasm and he's got to take a step of faith. There's an invisible bridge there that he can't see at the beginning, but he's just got to take this great big leap in faith. And is it an uncomfortable moment? Oh, it couldn't be more uncomfortable. You can see by when he swallows hard, he gulps a little bit. There's, there's a, a moment where he's got to mustered up the courage. He closes his eye, puts that foot out, and, he stu- and then he gets caught. There's something firm there to place his foot on. It's a step of faith, but then he discovers that it wasn't as dangerous as he thought it was. Today, I'm challenging us as we look at faith. We're going to be going through Hebrews chapter 11, and, and Hebrews chapter 11 God does something really unique in this chapter. He's showing you what faith looks like, and he doesn't do it through big miracle events. He doesn't do it through these great moments in Bible history. He does it through showing you snapshots of people, people who are not so much unlike you and I. It's almost as if God holds up this picture, and he says, do you see her? Do you see how she lived her life? That's what faith looks like. Over here, oh, do you see this guy? Do you see what he just did? That's that's what real faith looks like. Some of us, uh, we've been feeling like our, our, we haven't been growing much lately. Our faith hasn't grown much. And this summer, we're going to change that. Your, Your spiritual journey is about to get some gas put on it here, and the flame's about to get a little higher, simply because we're gonna look at these snapshots of faith. These are just, these are um, common people, but, but they discover an uncommon faith. These are ordinary people who discover that they trust an extraordinary God. And, and you and I can become like them. In fact, we're encouraged to become like them. Out here in the family room after service, I'm hoping you'll let me add your snapshot, your little picture to our wall of faith that we're putting together out there. But I'll tell you more about that in a minute. It, we're encouraged to join their story. This is going to be Israel's story, by the way. Hebrews 11 is part of Israel's story. But, but Israel's story is a story of God's people. And you and I are encouraged to jump in. Man, I, as Hebrews 11 goes by, it's almost like this fast river that's flowing by you. And you're encouraged to jump in and become a part of it. This was their story. This was their time. Now it's our turn to show faith. And I think this morning you and I have an opportunity to show our children, our families, our neighbors, our friends. This is what faith looks like when they look at how you and I live our lives. Let's jump right in. We're we're starting right at the beginning. You're here on the first Sunday of this series. This is going to be a good time for us. Hebrews chapter 11, starting with verse 1. Faith makes sure of what we hope for and gives us proof of what we cannot see. It was their faith, their faith, that made our ancestors pleasing to God. Now, this starts right off by saying, look at their faith. Uh, This pleased God. By the way, next week we'll have the verse, without faith you cannot please God. So right now, what's being told to us is this is their, this was their story. But look how quick it turns to the word are. Verse 3, but because of our faith, we now, we, we know that the world was made at God's command. We also know that what can be seen was made out of what cannot be seen. All right, that's a creation part. And then here we have our first character, verse 4. Because Abel had faith, he offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. God was pleased with him and his gift. And even though Abel is now dead, his faith still speaks on. His faith still speaks. Is there a chance that you and I could show a faith that goes way beyond our grave? That one day people will look back, you know, I have that. I, I can talk about my grandparents' faith. They're not around anymore, but I could talk about their faith. I got a father who's passed, and I can talk about his faith. Long after he dies, we can still look at that, and I can remember their faith. And 
you and I can maybe leave a legacy like that. According to Hebrews 11, though, here, when you're trying to, okay, what, how did he show his faith? It was through worship and sacrifice. Worship, going to worship, shows your faith. You know, your neighbors, what do you do on Sunday morning? Uh, I go to church. Really? You know, Jesus loved the church. Why wouldn't we love the church? Well, and so we go to church. We, we recognize that we need community. We recognize that we need a bigger family in our life. And even on Sundays when I may not, uh, when you don't feel like you're, that you need us that much, somebody needs you to be here. And so, you know, through worship, but also through his sacrifice, through his sacrifice that he gave to God. Uh, by the way, uh, sacrifice means giving up something you love for something you love more. Uh, God used it as an illustration for us husbands in this room. Husbands, love your wife as much as Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for her, that, that he sacrificed himself for his bride. Uh, few of my moments are, are great, but every so often with my wife over here, I give up something I want to give her something that she needs. That, that's how I demonstrate love. It's not, it's not perfect. She, don't amen. Stay quiet over there. But there's been good moments of that. This, is, this kind of faith of sacrificing can be a little uncomfortable. Uh, in American culture, everything is about comfort. And if anything is uncomfortable, avoid it. Avoid anything that's uncomfortable. But in our faith walk, it's, it can be a little uncomfortable at times. And God says it was Abel's sacrifice, that sacrifice that just keeps living on and on and on. All right, so what was the sacrifice? You, you know the story. You don't know the story. It doesn't matter. Back in the beginning of time, Adam and Eve started having kids. They had lots of kids, by the way, but only in Genesis are we told about two of their kids, Cain and Abel. Now, now these are two boys who, even though uh, they were raised, oh, okay, young parents, hear this just for a moment. They were raised to work and to worship. The, the, the two things that Adam and Eve made sure they learned to do was work and worship. I, I think that's important for young parents to hear. Work and worship is what they were taught to do. One was a rancher, one was a farmer. Now, in their worship, they brought sacrifices. The rancher, Abel, he brought a sacrifice of an animal. And, and the scriptures tell us that it was the best animal he had. It was, it was the best he could bring before God. It was a true sacrifice. You know, you, usually you want to keep multiplying the best animals, but he took his best animal and he offered it up to God. Cain did not bring the best. He brought, um, you know, some of his produce and, and offered that up to God. You know, maybe there's a warning here for you vegetarians, maybe. See, I thought that joke was worthy of more laughter than what you just offered just there. It, he comes, and it's not about the offering. It's, it's about the man who was given it, what was going on inside each of them. Just for a moment, could it be, could it be that Abel uh, brought an offering because he wanted to get closer to God and Cain brought an offering because he just wanted to get God off his back? Could it be on Sunday mornings when you bring your offering. Some, some of you drop your offerings in the offering boxes as you come in. Some of you drop it as you go out. Why do you do that? Is it because you want to trust God in your finances and you want a closer walk with him? Or is it because you give just so God won't be mad at you? And, and this is important in this story because there's this, this sacrifice, this offering that's taking place. One is acceptable to God. One is not acceptable to God. And boy, the scholars have turned that over and over and over again. Well, because God rejects Cain's offering, Cain's walking around. The Bible says he's downcast. That means he's, he's deeply depressed by it. So God comes to him. Cain, why art thou bummed out? That's my own interpretation, by the way, but it's, it's there. And Cain is unhappy. 
And then Cain's anger starts getting the best of him. Look what God tells him in Genesis chapter 4. The Lord said to Cain, what's wrong with you? Why why do you look so angry? If you had done the right thing, uh, you'd be smiling, but you did the wrong thing. And now sin is waiting to attack you like a lion. Sin wants to destroy you, but don't let it happen. Uh, uh, Later on, the apostle Peter will tap into that old story too when he says the Satan is like a roaring lion. He's seeking whom he may devour. He's after us. He's trying to get us. He's this lion that leaps on us. Sin leaps on us, but it's anger is the issue here. And oh my goodness, followers of Jesus, be careful of anger. Angry angry words, angry actions, they, they can just snarl us and pull us down and take us out so quickly. Uh, inside the story of Lord of the Rings, I also enjoy this movie's Lord of the Rings, uh, there is this character, Gollum or, or Smeagol, because he's, he's got two characters. He's, there's this battle going on inside this creature. In order to get the, the ring of power, he kills his relatives. We believe it's his brother. He kills his own brother to take capture of that ring of power. Um, the author who wrote Lord of the Rings was Christian, He taps into this old Cain and Abel story. What happens to Cain? Uh, His punishment is to wander. What happens to Gollum, to to Smeagol? He wanders. He's he's set out on his own. And he's always at battle. Does does Smeagol have his little moments where he can do some good things? He can be nice. But inside there's this battle. And the evil and the darkness wins more often than the good. And I think that's really what's going on in this story then. So Cain does the unthinkable, kills his brother. Where's your brother, God asks? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? (laughs) Oh, Just the fact that God asks, where's your brother? Yes, you are your brother's keeper. And then God tells him, your brother's blood is crying out to me. It's his blood. That cries out to me. Where is God when all these terrible things are happening? The blood cries out to God. He he hates violence. And, And in this terrible story, there's this son who allowed anger to get the best of him, and he lashes out because there's this battle going on inside him. Some of us have a war going on inside of us. Huh? Anybody in the room remember the old TV, the, the old TV television show, Incredible Hulk? Hulk, <laughs> Hulk, the Incredible Hulk. Anybody remember that? By the way, if you raise your hand, you're going to give your age away. All right, anybody remember it? Some of you have integrity issues. I'm just going to tell you that right now. I know you know that story. Bruce Banner, Bruce Banner could be the nicest guy, but if you got him angry, look out, this monster came out. And, and I find even as... A Christian man trying to walk this Christian journey, occasionally my, my anger can just get the best of me. We've got to be so aware of anger and what it does inside the story of Cain and Abel, but what it does inside of us too. You know, I, I share the rage that some of you feel in, in regards to our world. I share that. But, but you can't allow that to get in here. There's these two boys inside this story, same family, same parents, introduced to work and worship, two dramatically different outcomes, though. My heart goes out to uh, Adam and Eve in this story. They lose two sons in one day. Cain is driven away. Abel is dead. They, they lost two. Have you noticed that we only do as well as our, our kids are doing? Have you noticed that yet? If our kids are doing well, you know, how you doing? Good, good. But if our kids are not, then I'll say, ah, okay. Have you noticed we only do as well as our marriages are doing? You doing all right? Eh, it's been better. Have you noticed you only do as well as your job's going? It's because sometimes we, we allow those troubles to get in here. What, what do I mean by that? I'm... I haven't completely processed this all out yet, so you're getting in on the inside level. I I believe through this summer series, I'm going to discover the answer to my question, but 
it's, it's in regards to troubles. Jesus said, in this world, you will have troubles. He said, you will have troubles. But then he turns around, and in John chapter 14, he tells his followers, but don't let your hearts be troubled. So, so I'm going to have troubles all around me, but I, but I can't let those things get in here into my heart. How do I do that? And I don't have an answer for that yet. I, I think somewhere in this summer I'm going to discover it. I just haven't discovered it yet. Because when we're faced with... Tra- so my heart goes out to Adam and Eve. What is God doing in this story? Why does it happen way back in Genesis, but now he's using the story in Hebrews 11? God loves comparisons, by the way. He, he loves taking two things and comparing them to one another. You know, light and darkness, good and evil. Jesus mastered this, by the way. Je- Je- hey, there was these two builders, Jesus says. A wise builder, a foolish builder. The wise builder built his house on the rock. The foolish builder on the sand. The which one do you want to be like? It's these comparisons. Uh, two men went up to the temple to pray. Two. One prayed, I am such a sinner. Please forgive me. The other one prayed, I'm so glad I'm not like this other guy. Over. Which prayer do you want to offer up? Be careful in your choice. Two men died, Jesus says. One is a rich man. The other one is a poor beggar named Lazarus. They go to two different places. Look at them. Look at their life. Make a choice here, God. And then there's a, those two men on the cross, one on each side of Jesus. At the greatest moment in all of history, Jesus dying for mankind, one is mocking him, and the other one is saying, remember me. There's a a cross of rejection, a cross of reception, the old preachers used to say. You know, we live in a world that's mocking the death of Jesus. You get to make a choice. These comparisons, God loves these comparisons. So he puts up two more in front of us. Here's Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel. One was good, one was evil. The first murderer, by the way, was a churchgoer. He believed in God, he went to worship God, he brought a sacrifice before God, but there was something wrong inside. Jesse James, by the way, if you look this up, Jesse James, the old, the, the, the old uh, bank robber and murderer, was also a member of a church. Jesse James loved church. He loved reading the scripture, he loved singing songs, he loved going to church with people, but, but church didn't change him. He, he was there, but it didn't change who he was inside. Cain and Abel is a story of humanity. It marks two different paths for us. There's a good path, a high road. There's a low path, a low road. There's a path that's narrow that leads to, there's a wide path that leads to destruction. Again, comparisons. So this morning, you are leaving a testimony of your faith today. You're leaving a testimony. This is what faith looks like and it's in regards to worship and sacrifice. But it goes beyond that. I know so many of your stories. You have changed my journey and you don't even know you have. You have strengthened my spiritual walk because I've watched you in moments of great loss, in moments of great trouble, and then you still came to church. It was as as if you were saying, God still deserves an offering of praise from me. How how did you do that? I I watched you the Sunday after you lost jobs and you came to church and still worshiped. I watched you after after a week of losing your health and the very first Sunday you're out of the hospital, you're back in church praising and worshiping God. I've watched you lose marriages I've watched you lose loved ones. I've watched people stand by the grave of a child and, and did that on a Thursday or a Friday or a Saturday. And, and then Sunday morning you were here. Oh, big tears rolling down your face. But there you were. 
saying, my God still deserves my praise. What an unbelievable picture, a snapshot of faith. And I've held on to those in my walk. And I've remembered you. Mm. Yeah. Gosh, this summer series is going to be good for us. It's going to really stretch us. But this morning, Jesus loves the church. Why wouldn't we? And so when we're troubled, when we're crushed, when we're hurting so deep inside, the, steer, the tears will not stay in our eyes. We still go and worship. Not because it's comfortable, it's uncomfortable, but because he deserves it.